Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette and I'm so glad you're with us to stay curious. Thank you very much for allowing me to have a vacation and I'm thanking Bart Martindale for doing a wonderful job hosting our program last week. He had uh, actually a couple of interviews I'd like to have with Jamie out there at the Cape Canaveral uh, Air Force Museum. Jamie Draper did an awesome job and then we had Ron Guerin, an astronaut, spent 177 days in space. Bart, you did an outstanding job talking to those gentlemen. Then you had to put up with Triple T on Friday, so uh, we'll give you some bonus credits for that. But had a great time on my own vacation. We all need a little break. I was in the Nashville area, and uh, though it was a vibrant town, it was raining a lot. So, you know, you go with the flow there. But had a great time and recharged to bring you more space history, astronaut birthdays, and interviews with people that have worked in our wonderful American space program because that's what the American Space Museum is all about, preserving the birth of the American space age and inspiring that next generation of space workers. And we're going to talk about that next generation, uh, those four wonderful young astronauts that went to space over the weekend. Got a surprise, going to take you to their party that they had last night. So stick around for that. Thank you for, to Tim Gagnon, the patch guy the KSC artist who has his art orbiting the earth. Who can say that? Thank you, Tim Gagnon. We're going to share some of his personal photos that he was at the, the, uh, the look pretty wild. Nice little good uh, launch, uh, not launch party, landing party for the Inspiration4 astronauts. So uh, let's uh, also say welcome. Well, enjoy your last day of summer, folks, and uh, last day of winter for you, Dean Salzwittle, down there in New Zealand, and uh, some of our other friends down under as they're finally getting out of the, their winter. But we're getting out of our summer and into our fall tomorrow at uh, 3.21 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It's officially fall. So get those sweaters out. Of course, that means nothing here in Florida. It's the same all the time, and that's why we love living here, I guess. So, But, uh, no, we're looking forward to less rain and some cooler temperatures for sure here. But the summer, uh, the autumnal equinox is tomorrow, and that's the first day of autumn, of course. So goodbye summer 2020, and uh, hello autumn. 2021. 2021, yes. 2020 was a blur. We, we all forgot about that summer. So um, let me get rolling here with something we love to talk about because they're in our communities doing great things. That's those 350 some sh space shuttle astronauts. And we're going to give a big happy birthday to this guy. All right, Rick Heeb. And my notes, happy 66th birthday to Richard James Heeb. He was born September 21st, 1955 in Jamestown, North Dakota. Not many astronauts from North Dakota. He had 31 days in space and three spacewalks on his three space shuttle missions. In one of his most famous space shuttle missions, STS-49, Rick was one of three people grabbing a communication satellite with their hands, the only triple person EVA in American history, and I think in, in, in human history. I don't think Russia's done three people on EVA at one time. So happy birthday, Rick Heeb. He is currently a faculty member at the University of Boulder uh, and uh, very involved in engineering sciences. He, he's a, a, a Colorado guy, University of Colorado Boulder, Master of Science and Engineering, but he grew up in Jamestown, North Dakota. Happy birthday to Rick Heeb, who is 66 years old today. And a little bit of space history that, how about, you gamers out there watching us on Twitch, we hope a bunch of you are out there. Jessica Galloway, our computer engineer, she's a, and her husband are big gamers, and she got us hooked up on Twitch. And I told her earlier that in 1959, essentially, the joystick was invented. What's up with that? Well, in 1959, and we love bringing you old school history, with, uh, and I need my old school glasses to, to read it here. Between September 21st today and October 10th, 1959, a research program was carried out by the Aviation Medical Acceleration Lab to measure the effects of sustained acceleration on a pilot's ability to control a vehicle. And of course, 
with the crazy rocket launches and, and you have to be exposed to all kinds of forces in every direction, that was important. Various sidearm controllers were used and it appeared that the three axis type, the yaw, roll, and pitch was the most satisfactory. And this was later configured, uh, this configuration was extensively evaluated and adopted for use in the first the Mercury, Gemini, and then the Apollo systems. And it's basically the joystick, although I know game controllers now are a lot different and very few of them use a joystick, right, Jessica? But now, but, but now they know when you move it. But here is a very expensive joystick that was found in the trash in St. Louis. This was in a Gemini training uh, spacecraft back in 1965. This was a training with the yaw yep back with the, this is found in a trash by someone who loaned it to us on, uh, not loaned it to us, they consigned it to our, one of our auctions about two years ago. And to my recollection, it sold for about $17,000. And uh, look at how cool that is, a real Gemini controller. Born in 1959 on this date out of a program that was uh, but the Aviation Medical Acceleration Lab was in control of how we controlled things back in the day. So I thought we'd lay that out you there. We got a comment from one of our Stay Curious watchers out there. Go ahead, Jessica. I'm going to switch that mic. Uh, we have some folks in our studio today and uh they pointed to this uh go ahead and show that again they thought that maybe that might have a little tie-in we're gonna hopefully get this guy back on the show oh, get yes, some information yes, we got some guests here from california good did, did you recognize that he's got some roots with the space program oh, okay okay and well i mean you know we're gonna try to get this gentleman on i forgot to get his name what's your name Bruce Smith. Bruce Smith. Bruce, Bruce Smith, Smith worked on uh, uh, many of the programs out there. We may have him on tomorrow as a, as a guest there. They're visiting from California. How'd you like the museum, Bruce and your wife? Wonderful. Wonderful. Good. Well, we'll have you back tomorrow and uh, look forward to that. So, uh, But we're, we always welcome you to come in to the museum and watch uh, our broadcast of Stay Curious. We've really gotten a, a, a whole studio built up here. In fact, uh, one of the comments I got from one of our guests emailed me and says, there's quite a studio you have set up there. And yes, we've come a long way from Marty and I having a, a camera and our microphone was a conference speaker. And uh, now that the weather's breaking, we'll get you out. We did that conference speaker out at Space View Park uh, and we need to go out there more and we're going to do that when the weather breaks. So iffy this time of day, whether it's going to rain or not. So. Uh, but we, but we welcome you all. Yeah, every day they tell me it's rained since I've been uh, gone on my vacation. And uh, I'm going darn well. I was losing my Florida tan and need to, need to start getting it back. So, by the way, just look at this beautiful earth behind us here as we're looking at the last day of summer. A photograph taken from the space station. Uh, that is the day or the daybreak over the Terminator there while uh, Europe and, and Asia are, are in uh, nighttime. And we just can't thank Jessica Galloway enough for reinventing the wheel for Marty and I to bring you these nice graphics and different way of presenting our Stay Curious program. We're still going to do some old school things, of course. Having me around is one of them. But we're so glad that everyone is supporting us. And you can support us in many ways, uh, including purchases on Amazon Smile, okay? And, uh, and also we have the American Space Museum Galaxy of Giving, where we're creating a constellation, and we just finished our first uh, heart constellation, a, a, a celebration of constellations, and uh, we'll tell you more about how you can give to our galaxy uh, of constellations, uh, but a hundred bucks will get a star for you up there. We'll tell you a little bit about that at the end of the program, because we want to bring you some more space history, and on this date in history was a very interesting thing that happened. And that was this replica of this Russian spacecraft landed on the moon. And then you see in the front right there of, of the picture, that is the scoop that it pounded down and scooped up three ounces of, of soil and rock, put it in the device at the top. That device rocketed off the moon, all right, in 1970 on this day in history. The first automatic sample from an, an, an alien world was taken and blasted off the surface of the moon. Two days later, it lands on Earth. Uh, 
the spacecraft was called the uh, Luna 16, all right. It, uh, when it did land on Soviet territory, it's only a, a, about a, a three foot, not even that, about a, 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 a one, about a two foot diameter capsule. It had a 10 square meter parachute under it, bringing it down. And Russia thought it'd take 15 to, to, uh, or more launches to perfect this system, and they nailed it in the sixth try of landing a spacecraft on the moon and then scooping up some of it and bringing it back. Now, this was 1970, September 21st. So, yes, America had already landed twice, Apollo 11 and two astronauts, and Apollo 12 doubled down in November 69. And this was sort of a... Uh, well, you know, they had to do something and because and, uh, they, they lost the moon race to America with the humans. So they brought back an automated sample. And some of these minute samples of this, I'm talking grains of sand of this, sold for $800,000 in 2018 at a famous uh, auction house. So. That's about as big as any computer. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, uh, so we, we're grateful for the new computer, the new equipment we've got going here. Uh, what did we get uh, just the other day that uh, was new, Jessica? Rechargeable batteries, Rechargeable batteries we got. A little thing, but, but hey, we're spending your money wisely because we're a nonprofit and we enjoy reaching out our museum this way. And uh, Mondays is Stargazer Mark is telling you about what's in space. That's me. Fridays is Tales from the White Room with Triple T. Thursdays mostly will be throwback Thursdays. We're going to look back at some obscure artifact we have in our museum uh, and, and space history. So you're going to be entertained. Tell your friends on Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube to follow us, subscribe to us, like us, and love us. Okay, so next up we have is this was the view out of Atlantis in 1989. When Mike McCulley, our great friend of the museum, was pilot of Atlantis on STS-34, and that was the Galileo spacecraft that they put in Earth orbit, and then another rocket attached to the Galileo sent it to Jupiter. And that was 1989. And Galileo began orbiting Jupiter uh, uh, four years later, and then it orbited Jupiter for eight years. It was like a, an eight, a five year mission and Atlanta lasted a lot longer. And why this is significant today in history, because this is the day that we burned up Galileo after you saw it in the cargo bay of Atlantis in 1889. And in 2003, we ended the mission on this date by sending Galileo on a kamikaze crash into the atmosphere of Jupiter. Of course, it burned up. Now, this artist's depiction of it is wrong because the antenna here never unfolded out. And, and NASA had to work around that. It was They figured out some bolt system did not release like it was supposed to. So this gigantic antenna that was supposed to stream back data didn't work. And they had to work around it with the smaller communication uh, antennas and still got fabulous research. But they would have got higher resolution photos sent back here that this antenna works. Still, they got eight years of great science. Now, why would you destroy the spacecraft and not just leave it orbiting around lonely old Jupiter? What's the harm in that? Well, a lot. We, they were worried that at some point in history, maybe 100 years from now, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 10,000 years from now, that this spacecraft would slam into one of Jupiter's moons, and three of them are very icy, which there's a potential to have wherever there's water, potential for life. So they wanted to get those out of the way so nothing would contaminate the moon Europa or Callisto or Ganymede. And then they also wanted to make sure that human uh, germs or so forth were not, that could have gotten on the spacecraft, did not populate our solar system. And boy, a couple years ago, you'd say to that, Mark, that's strange. How can a germ populate an entire planet? Yeah, well, where's my mask, Jessica, <laughs> as we walk through this museum? In this pandemic so NASA's always thinking about cleanliness and keeping things clean so that's why we destroyed at the end of its life the Galileo spacecraft on this date in 2003 yes Jessica comment I'm gonna swap that mic here uh, you guys have seen the first Star Trek movie right so you yes. know that obviously if we leave stuff in space it can go wrong 
That's a good there point. Viger. Go. Viger. I was the, saying. Actually, I read the book first, and I never caught the Viger part of it that was spelled out, and I should have. That that was Voyager One was what was part of the plot of uh, the the first Star Trek. Lessons learned. <laughs> yep, that's from our Trekkie Techie there, and uh, uh, glad that that you chimed in on that. So we love space history like this. You know, I'm a moon crazy person and love the moon. And uh, anytime we talk about these moon missions, because we've, we've not brought back much of the moon at all, about a thousand pounds from uh, the Apollo missions of 1969, 70, 71, 72. And then Russia did this three times and brought back soil. But what happened back in May? Oh, that's right. China, their first attempt brought back four pounds of the moon that's in their labs right now being analyzed on their first attempt quite a comp actually more complicated than this mission in 1970 of luna 16. so let's move on from that and finally to, to show you today um, something that uh, popped up on facebook was our good friend tim gagnon tim is known as the patch guy he is at kscartist.com and you can buy his patches on zazzle.com uh, slash store slash KSC artist. And Tim, glad to promote you. He's been a, a, a wonderful friend of the American Space Museum uh, for a decade or more, way before I even caught wind of it. I'll never forget being at a Kennedy Space Center event. Tim's rather a large man, tall. He had this beautiful jacket with all these patches on it. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to get to know that guy. And so I have, a, I'm proud to call you a friend, Tim. He has art orbiting the Earth in the International Space Station. Who can say that, huh? How cool is that? And Tim, because he worked with astronauts on some patches on the space shuttle, all right, like STS-133, uh, he helped finish for uh, the great uh, Mr. Robert McCall, who passed away during that. Uh, and Tim's got a Spanish partner in Spain. I forget his name, Tim, forgive me for that. Uh, uh, almost came to my head, but uh, so Tim gets invited to some things because he's got astronauts as friends that he sat down with, and they said, "Okay, crew, what are the elements that you want in your patch?" He's done four or five like that. He's done International Space Station patches, and Tim does a lot of special patches for commemorating events, 50th anniversaries, and so forth. Very talented guy, bragging on him a lot because we love him here at the museum. He's always happy to see his face around and he's he is a social media monster okay and uh but and so tim posted some of these pictures of the inspiration for the four astronauts that spent three days in space over the weekend the first all civilian crew there there was no a, uh, professional astronaut on board it was all basically fly by wires but they knew how to do things i'm sure in a case of emergency they had a party sunday night Tim was invited to it. Uh, we've got a comment, uh, Jessica. I went ahead and Ooh, I went ahead and dropped his link to his social media in the comments on Facebook. Okay, so uh, good. I'll try to get it on Twitch and YouTube Thank as well. You. But I had a quick, quick drop in there. Good. As, as we so you can just go to Tim's wonderful work. He's always coming up with something new, and uh, uh, so he was at this party that I understand was in Orlando, and he just. Uh, I asked him permission over, over Messenger if we could use these pictures. He said yes. A couple people on Facebook asked him where it was. He said it was in a hangar somewhere. So it looks like a good time was had by all. They had these uh, stilted people walking around with LED lights. You got your, your I'm sure there's some disco music in the blasting in the, the background there. And there's Tim with the family of... Uh, 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 Cy Proctor, the, the, uh, the, the lady there is uh, Cy Proctor. She, this was one of her big dreams. She's a rather flamboyant lady. That's her family there that Tim got a picture with. I understand that um, uh, astronaut um, oh, uh, Scott Perzinski was there, who, who's a friend of Tim's and took some of these pictures, uh, the pictures of Tim, uh, he, he said there. So there's Tim there. Let me go to the next one. I'm going backwards. Yeah, I'm going back. I'm going backwards. Sorry, getting my mojo on here after vacation. There are our four new astronauts. Okay, 
uh, no question, anybody that, that orbits the Earth, whether they, they control the spaceship or not, uh, has got to be an astronaut in my book. So four more space travelers. Jessica, that makes 572 total uh, official, the, the official books, uh, say, uh, have been in space. Uh, two more women make it 66 females have been to space. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, of course, we've got those few orbital uh, ones that uh, were suborbital, uh, I mean, about, uh, and you can put them in any, anywhere you want. But we're counting the ones that have been to orbit, including Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom were suborbital for NASA, right? But then they orbited Earth later on subsequent missions. How fast do you think we'll get to 1,000? How fast will we get to 1,000? Well, you know what? The way things are going, with uh, if, if things go the way they're supposed to, and they never do, of course. Uh, we, I mean, 572 in 61 years, okay, 60 years, 1961, with Gagarin. So I'd say we can probably double that in an easy 20 years. But, you, but if they start putting 30 people on a rocket ship going to Mars, uh, who knows? Point is, space is pretty hard, and I'm developing a program for Stay Curious to not only commemorate these space travelers, but we had six or seven other people who paid their way to space, actually space tourists, uh, and uh, they're kind of forgotten. Uh, but uh, we'll have a little program about those space tourists that did go through a lot of astronaut training. Some of them even stayed on the International Space Station. So we wanted to say that left to right there is the commander, Jared Isaacman, who was the billionaire that financed this. Uh, Haley Arsenault, a cancer survivor who was at St. Jude's Hospital that this was a fundraiser for. Chris Sembrowski is the other gentleman that uh, uh, paid for his ride, and pilot Cy Proctor there. And, uh, you know, I've got to say that I really unplugged on my vacation, and I tried to find on, on general news about this mission, and there just wasn't much news at all. And obviously they didn't do any live broadcasts in their three days in space. This is a Netflix project and a fundraiser for St. Jude's. But I was a little bit disappointed I didn't get to see a live video of them looking out that cupola window, the big bubble uh, that they had at the end where the docking collar was. And I'm telling you, I tried to find it on news, CNN, all, all, the, all of them, okay, CNN, Fox, whoever, local news, and I hardly saw anything about this mission. Uh, yeah, they are. They'll probably push it as a big, but uh, Netflix is going to push it out as a big production here. But hey, what? This opens a completely new era. They did it. Uh, obviously, they didn't have any problems. Uh, there were some inside things that the toilet didn't work the way it was supposed to, and they had a couple other hiccups. But this was a completely automated space flight flown by SpaceX controllers in Hawthorne, California. Kudos to them for, and, and, and Elon Musk for taking this up to another level. All right. And then we got some real some astronauts are going to the space station here at the end of the month, October or ne next month, October 31st. And uh, but um, it's very interesting how this is going to play out. SpaceX won't say how much was the charge for this. Elon Musk charges 65 million dollars for his booster rocket launches, all right, to deliver a satellite to space. So you got that. However. Musk kicked in $50 million to St. Jude's, and the, uh, the one gentleman, uh, Chris uh, Sembrowski, I think, kicked in $100 million. He's a, a very wealthy man. And uh, so St. Jude's already made about $200 million off of this. And uh, so anyway, it, it was quite a, in a historic event. I'm kind of sad we didn't see more live about it, but we'll see more about it. Uh, there is astronaut... Uh, Karzinski. We'll see more about it when Netflix wants us to, I guess. So, and I haven't paid for Netflix in a long time since they took the Marx Brothers off of Netflix. Netflix. Okay. <laughs> She's rolling her eyes. By the way, Marty's not here. He took the day off. Marty will be back next week. I missed my buddy Marty the last week also. One of our, our ardent volunteers here. Marty sold a lot of t-shirts at the, the launch of these uh, wonderful people on uh, uh, Wednesday when it was my getaway day. So, uh, But here's the party. There is Tim, Tim Gagnon there with uh, uh, Mr. Chris Sombrowski. And Tim is cuddling up there with Haley Arsenault. She's got a bright future ahead of her for sure. And there is the commander, Jared Iceman. 
and pilot Cy Proctor. So glad you had a great time, Tim. I mean, it looks like a blast. Uh, Tim loves that disco music, you can tell. He's just a oompa oompa in there with him, I'll bet, dancing his legs off there. Uh, and then going home and collac collapsing like me because we're both heart, heart attack survivors and uh, whatnot. But uh, so glad that Tim got to look out that cupola window, too. Apparently they had some sort of a, a setup there for a picture for inspiration for. This is apparently what the cupola dome looked like on that spacecraft there. So glad that you got to do that. And thank you for letting us share your fun time with the Inspiration4 astronauts, Tim Gagnon. And we can't, though he has been on Stay Curious before, we're going to have to have him back with our high-tech situation there. So have we got any other comments? We've got just some love from Robert Law watching on his big TV, Dave Stang from Macomb, Michigan, Apollo Sun from Tampa Bay. Um, I dropped that link to KSC artist Tim Gagnon in the comments. And right. I'm going to turn off the wrong label there. Sorry. This is not Bart. This Happy is Mark. Happy birthday to Susie Cunningham yesterday, by the way. I saw a picture with her and another uh, Florida Space Coast fan, Margot Watson. So happy birthday to you, Susie. She's quite a songbird, beautiful singer. She and her husband love to, to play around the, the Space Coast. Maybe we'll catch them here at an event uh, at the American Space Museum. And uh, we're grateful to Hazel Banks and Sylvia Monaco, some of our local people following us here. Uh, we've got people all around the world. Uh, Dan uh, McCune, also our, our facilities manager. Thank you, Dan, for all that you do here. And Connie McDaniel, we're missing you, Connie. Get well and get back here. I got a lot of jewelry for you to help me sell on eBay. So, And that's one way you can help us. We're putting some new stuff up on eBay all the time. Uh, American Space Museum has an eBay presence. We are having an auction. October 9th on Saturday. You'll be hearing more about the next, I think it's our 17th Space Memorabilia Auction with Chuck Jeffrey. Uh, Going to auction off $200,000 worth of space memorabilia, a lot of it on consignment, but we get a good chunk of that to keep our museum open. Anything else? Oh, sponsors. Uh, we are going to uh, create another constellation with some of our sponsors. Your logo here. All right, and we'll put your kid's name. We're going to start putting some up there this week. Jessica, I'll send you some pictures to put the UCAC brothers in there. And here is our first constellation uh, of our galaxy of giving, the Celebrations Constellation of the Heart. And in our regular night sky, we have 88 constellations. So we got lots of room up there. But this, this is $11,000 in donations the past year from astronaut Mike McCulley to my high school classmates, uh, uh, Winecoop there. And uh, at Conklin on the left, that is our wonderful director, Karen Conklin, and her husband, Mark. And Karen's been involved with this museum almost 20 years and uh, uh, three and a half, almost four years going as the director. And of course, our wonderful chairman of the board, Charlie Mars. Uh, they just had a good board meeting last week, so Charlie's got everything ready to for us to get into the fall and start helping you all out there stay curious. So glad to be with you today. And tomorrow we got more space history and another astronaut birthday. So join us then. I'm Mark Marquette on behalf of our whole staff here at the American Space Museum. We're glad that you joined us and we will see you in our museum soon to bridge the space between us. <music>